And what did I do? Did I commit some great dark sin? Uh, have I failed them in some ways? Because one thing we've talked about before is that Satan is always trustworthy. Satan is reliable. We can count on him to distort, deceive, depress, and discourage us. So God continued to say, son, I can't not be faithful. Mm. And yeah, this doesn't make sense to you. But right now, I'm trusting you with a sovereign opportunity to practice what you've spent your life in. Gary, either I'm faithful or I'm not. And uh, wow. I said, well, I believe you're faithful. I, I, I've written, I've spoken. Yeah. But now you're going to have a whole different level. I'm trusting you with a whole different level of opportunity. You are listening to the Famous at Home podcast with Dr. Josh and Christy Straub. Because when it's all said and done, we all want to know that we were famous at home. Welcome back to the Famous at Home podcast. Today, got a credible interview with my dear friend, Dr. Gary Oliver. You know, this is a man who I have been wanting to have on the podcast for a very long time, and we finally got our schedules worked out to make it happen, but he is a mentor. He's a friend. I uh, can't even begin to tell you the years and the conversations and the, the the deep friendship and the cultivating of just our, our spiritual lives together uh, has just been beautiful. And uh, I've been wanting to introduce him to you, our podcast family, for a very long time, and today we get to do that. And so he is, he, he's got all kinds of accolades, he's got all kinds of things throughout the years, but um, regardless of all of those accomplishments, he is a modern-day Job. He is somebody who the Lord has um, just genuinely taken on a journey, and a deeper journey. And, and what's cool is he, he leads today Going Deeper Retreats, and you can find those at goingdeeper.org. We're going to put those in the show notes, and you'll hear me talk a little bit about my journey in going through uh, that, that, that uh, program with him. But I just I, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, you can also find some of his other resources. He's got parenting resources that he wrote years ago that are even out of print. Uh, I'm going to do my best to put a lot of those in the show notes uh, through this episode as well, just so you can go back and just see some of his wisdom through the years. But more than anything, as you listen to this episode, I hope that you take with you just the beauty of his soul, the beauty of his journey. Uh, I joke with him that, uh, uh, that that I'm grateful that he went on it so that hopefully I learned the lessons and don't have to. Um, but you'll see that. You'll see his sense of humor and you'll just see just how passionate he is and how serious he is about pursuing Jesus. And I think as parents, there's nothing greater that we can be doing right now than pursuing Jesus because it's in our pursuit of Jesus that our kids pursue Jesus, that our kids see us in our spiritual journey. And again, you'll hear me say this often, our becoming matters more than our parenting. And so... Gary Oliver, his conversation with us today uh, leads us into that, and he gives us incredibly practical examples of how to do that as busy, overwhelmed, and so oftentimes frustrated parents. Before we jump into the episode, I just want to highlight again, uh, as we have been, the three big initiatives we have going on this year with Famous at Home. Number one is our Leaders Heart Cohort for Men coming up at the end of the month, February 26 to 29. It's a six-month cohort. Uh, it is filling up. And so I would love for you to sign up for that. Uh, before that does, uh, you might want to get in quickly because it, I believe it will fill up, which we're really, really excited about. As we've prayed into this, we've been really praying that it would fill up and and and. It, it's looking like it's going to. And so um, you might want to get in now uh, before it's too late. Um, we, we have to do a waiting list for the next one. Uh, the next thing that we're, we're doing is our My Kids EQ uh, eight-week coaching cohort is launching March 4th. 
Uh, be sure to subscribe and, and, and register for that. It's an eight-week cohort. If you need more information, just uh, go to the website, check it out, mykidseq.com. you also find it in the show notes today, or just send us an email through the website, and we'll get back to you and answer any questions you have. And then finally, the Tender and Fierce Coaching Program with Christy. Uh, that is going to be something special. Uh, she has been praying into that. She has been developing that and preparing for that for quite some time. And so if you're a woman... Uh, who is interested in receiving coaching, group coaching with Christy. Uh, this is going to be a, a quite a beautiful experience, I believe. And we would love to have you check that out. Tender and Fierce Group Coaching Cohort with Christy coming up. Uh, you'll see the link in the show notes to sign up for that as well. Without further ado, I would love to introduce you to my dear friend, Dr. Gary Oliver. Welcome back to the Famous at Home podcast. Dr. Gary Oliver, thank you so much for being with us. Always a joy, bud. Man, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, Gary is a dear friend, um, but uh, so much, so many conversations, so many memories that I've had of mutual encouragement. Uh, but you know, I also don't just see you as a dear friend, but also a mentor, and I look up to you in so many ways. And you know, as we began the new year here, I kept thinking, who do we talk to? Uh, to really encourage our listeners, our podcast family. And of course, the Lord always has, always has you in my mind. I'm praying for you constantly. I know you pray for, uh, you're one of those men that pray for our family every single day. Um, and we are so grateful for that. And I just want to encourage, you know, uh, those of you families out there, you know, to find people in your lives who you're constantly praying for, who are encouraging you, praying for you. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for those prayers because I genuinely believe that they're the single most important thing that we can be doing for our kids, no matter what any parenting quote unquote expert says uh, in a book anywhere. Prayer matters, I think, more than any of it. And so, um, Gary, I just want to publicly thank you for your prayers for our family and just the influence you've had in our lives. And I'm so grateful to get to share you with everybody today. And so I would love for you to just share a little bit about your story. Um, I, when I describe people, when I describe you to people, I describe you as a modern day Job, uh, based on a lot of your experiences. And I would love for you to kind of share that a little bit as we get started. And, uh, because I think there's so much wisdom uh, that the Spirit's going to be able to pour out today. Well, uh, basically, uh, I grew up in a Christian home. I went to Sunday school uh, 12 years without missing a Sunday, perfect attendance. By the time I started uh, college, I'd memorized several hundred Bible verses. I um, uh, got a, a, a BA from a Christian college and a three-year Master of Divinity, a two-year Master of Theology, so I have tons of undergraduate and postgraduate theology, and then God uh, dropped me did an MA and PhD in psychology. So most folks know me as a psychologist, a therapist, which I am, but uh, I'm, primar I'm primarily a theologian, a Bible student, a Christ follower at heart. And um, so, uh, but God uh, sometimes trusts his people with some stuff that's not always fun. Uh, in 2005, my dad died uh, after extended illnesses, so I buried my dad. Uh, the next year, in, uh, oh, and then about four months later, my late wife, Terry, uh, we've been married 25 years, was diagnosed with metastatic pancreatic cancer, given roughly three months to live. The doctor told me outside of her room that it might be less than that. God gave her a bit longer. The next year, in 2006, I had my fifth cancer surgery and uh, had chemo, radiation, couldn't talk for several months. I wrote a note to the doctor and said, will my voice come back? And he said, well, there's a 50, 50 chance it will. Well, it did. And uh, the next year, in 2007, in May, my middle son, Matt, died. And then two months later, my wife of then 27 years, Terry, died of metastatic pancreatic cancer. In 2008, my only sibling, my older sister, Marcia, died. And uh, so in four years, I lost four immediate family members. Mm -hmm. I buried my entire nuclear family and half of my current family. And I had spent my life teaching, talking, sharing. I 
God blessed me as being uh, one of the founding members of Promise Secrets. I spent uh, over 10 years speaking to over a million men in stadiums across the country about Jesus and God and his faithfulness and his goodness. And uh, here in four years, I have cancer for a fifth time, and I'm burying family members right and left. And then about a year and a half later, my cancer returned again. And uh, I had a 10 and a half hour surgery. When I woke up in ICU after being several days on the ventilator, the doctor said, well, because my mouth was sewn shut. And uh, my jaw was puffed out and expanded. And uh, I had seven tubes coming in me around the bed and said, well, we saved your life. And uh, he wasn't being funny. He said, uh, but uh, we took out almost all your time. You've lost almost all your salivary glands, your taste buds. Uh, you'll never be able to chew it again without choking, so you'll have a feeding tube the rest of your life. So after all of my losses and all of my serving and doing great things for God and trying to be faithful, now uh, I'm not even going to be able to speak. Well, by God's grace, my voice kind of came back and I was able to mumble a few words and uh, I began to be able to speak. But that's why I talk a bit funny now. But again, it took me five months, five months, Josh, to learn how to say my ABCs. So when you've spoken as much as I had around the world and stuff and you can't say your ABCs, it's like, what the fat is God doing? And where is he? Now, what did I do? Did I commit some great dark sin? Have, uh, have I failed them in some ways? Because one thing we've talked about before is that Satan is always trustworthy. Satan is reliable. We can count on him to distort, deceive, depress, and discourage us. So God continued to say, son, I can't not be faithful. And yeah, this doesn't make sense to you. But right now, I'm trusting you with a sovereign opportunity to practice what you've spent your life in. Gary, either I'm faithful or I'm not. And uh, wow. I said, well, I, I believe you're faithful. I, I, I've written, I've spoken. Yeah. But now you're going to have a whole different level. I'm trusting you with a whole different level of opportunity. And that began to help me see, Josh, that sometimes in life, some of the stuff that happens to us, it doesn't happen unbeknownst to him. He can't not love us. He can't not be faithful. He can't not be present. He is a promised keeper. But sometimes he takes this jolly good time at doing that. So uh, I began to recover and get better. And then eight months later, I'm able to mumble now. I go back down to N.B. Anderson. And uh, the doctors say, well, Gary, your cancer's come back. This is eighth time. We can't operate. There's nothing we can do. You have less than three months to live. Go home and call hospice. So when the top guys in the head neck cancer at N.B. Anderson say, there's nothing you can do, Odds are good, there's nothing you can do, there's they can do. So I came home and I got ready. But friend, I had such a sense of peace and God's presence. And um, at one, one point, I sensed him saying, Gary, if you want to go home and join your family members, you can. If you want to stay here, you can. There's still some things I'd like to use you with, but it's almost like he gave me a choice. Wow. And uh, it was very simple. You know, God, when I get to heaven, I'll be there forever. If I can stay here, I will. And after three months, I was alive. After four months, I was still alive. I contacted MD Anderson, and that was 13 years ago. I go back every year. And they said that I'm kind of one of the poster boys of that head and neck department. Uh, that I, I shouldn't be alive. 
I shouldn't be speaking. I should have had to have half of my job removed because I don't have any teeth here. 95% of uh, food in a restaurant, I can't eat without choking. I, I can choke taking vitamin pills. Wow. And, um, but it's, it's like God said, okay, son, I'm going to trust you. But during this time, Josh, God gave me one of the most powerful gifts with all my years of education and research and reading, one point I had a 4,000 volume private library. Uh, God taught me about sovereign joy. And do, do you ever me remember us talking about that? Yeah, I do. You actually did a, uh, uh, which I, well, I'll point to people. You talk about this even um uh, it was a Christmas message, I believe, that you gave on joy. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll put this in the show notes for people to listen to because it's so powerful to me. Yeah. Well, just very briefly, um, um, do, do I have time to unpack this a bit? I would love for you to, yeah. Because I, I okay. and, and I, yeah, and I'm going to ask you some questions of taking us into this because these lessons that you're learning, so many of us, it's, we're such a, in the Western world, we are so instant gratification here and now. Oh. God is, you know, um, God is sovereign. He's awesome. I trust him. I believe in him until the very littlest thing is an inconvenience in our lives. And I know that for me, like I'm a wimp, like if we'll single littlest thing, it's like, I'm praying for something, believing for something and it doesn't happen. I'm like, God, where are you? Why didn't you show up? What's going on now? You take this to the, to this whole other extreme where you lose or you lose your immediate family, you you lose half of your current family in four years, you you have cancer eight times, you are given three months to live, you say you're never going to taste again, you ne you're never going to eat again, and all of a sudden, God has taken you into this dynamic. I, these lessons that you learned in that moment, I think, are the very things that I'm going Okay, Lord, I want to learn those now so I don't have to experience what Gary had to go through. I've had some friends say, Doc, you must be a very slow learner. <laughs> oh, goodness. And, yeah. And take that's us, okay. Yeah, take us into sovereign joy, please. Okay, well, just briefly, I had this aha uh back in the middle of my, my darkest time, Josh. This aha uh that. A primary objective of Christ's teaching was not that we have the right view of prophecy and the right view of baptism and the right view of doing the Lord's Supper and the right view of stuff that divides all kinds of de denominations. I'm not putting that down, but a primary thing of his teaching is that we become like him and his father. And he talked a lot about joy. And I never realized that. I mean, I, I, I took the whole book of Ephesians from Greek to English, translated, got a, a, an A on the paper. So I, I knew the word, but I had totally missed that. Joy, joyful, and joyous are found over 200 times. And the word rejoice is found over 200 times. Uh, I, I just started to sound these things. Have I spoken to you, John 15? That you may be filled not dabbled with or sprinkled, filled with joy, and that your joy may overflow. And in the midst of my darkest time, my loneliness time, my what in the world's going on God time, it's like I had a sense of his presence. And I had joy. And even as I buried some family members, I wasn't happy. But I had joy because joy and happiness are the same thing. And uh, here are just four quick things. And, and my message on sovereign joy, which you mentioned, uh, I'm passionate. But number one, one of the main things we can do, not when everything's wonderful, but in the midst of what in the world's going on, God, number one, choose to set my mind on things above. Don't ignore what's going around me, but the master thief, Satan's most powerful thief is fear. And when we have fear, it victimizes us, it paralyzes us, and it can control us. And um, when we fear, we reach into the future. And when I live in fear, I'm living out there. I'm not living in, in the present. I'm living in the past or in the future. And Satan loves that. Yeah. But in the present, 
It's in this here and now where I can experience God's presence and God's faithfulness. And, and God doesn't want us to ignore our problems. I uh, I grew up Baptist, and I, I'm not putting Baptist down, but kind of what I heard is if you have problems, just ignore them, things will get better. But what I learned is with God's presence, I can embrace my problems, but look beyond my problems. And that all him turn your eyes upon Jesus, you know, uh, Philippians 4, 8, Colossians 3, 2, anyway. So number one, choose to set my mind on things above. And I sometimes have to do that 25, 30 times a day. Does that make sense? Yeah. And how take us into that. Uh, take us into what does it look like, especially uh, especially a lot of us in seasons of life. I've got a three-year-old who's running around who's in his uh, people will call it three major stage, uh, terrible three independent, you know, prefrontal cortex is not developed at all. No emotion regulation, no cognitive flexibility, losing yeah. his ever loving mind. And I'm dealing with that while I'm also trying to, you know, take care of the other two kids, love my wife, work, have a business, you know, <laughs> serve people. And, you know, you're, it's just like, it feels like it's a lot every day. And a lot of our listeners are in that season where it's just a lot every day. You know, and there's just a lot going on. Um, can you, because you have helped me so much in, and we'll post uh, some links to uh, Gary's Going Deeper ministry. I have been through uh, part of that. Uh, I want to continue that process. Uh, but going deeper, just taking people deeper. What does that, what are some of the practices that uh, you would recommend to fix your mind on things above in the middle of those real life circumstances? One of the things, um, you know, growing up, I was not a morning person. And I jokingly was pretty sure that before Adam had sinned, there wasn't morning. The day <laughs> started at noon and went to maybe 2 a.m., okay? Uh, and then when Adam and Eve sinned, God says, let there be mornings, because I hated getting up. But you know, as I read the uh, different fathers and mothers and, and, and those who have lived for a couple of thousand years who had an intimate walk with Christ and uh, some contemporary folks, I realized that how I start my day often determines my day. So about 20 years ago, I made the mistake of saying, God, if you want me to get up in the morning, you wake me up. And if you wake me up, I'll get up. That was a big mistake, Josh. Never pray that unless you mean it, because I wake up every morning, 4.45, 5. If I'm doing something in, in, in Thailand with missionaries, I fly over. My first morning, I wake up 4.45, 5. If I'm in Israel or if I'm in London, wherever, doesn't matter where I am, I wake up. And um, I still don't like mornings, but I have found them how I start my day. If I have 10 minutes, if I have whatever, I start by setting my mind on things above. And for me, once I've woken up, I have to take a shower and stuff. Once I've woken up, I I go on my study and uh, there's a little app called Lectio 365 that I have found so helpful. Um, and uh, I, I read Psalms every day. And if I have time, I may read another passage. I do more things, but part of my morning rhythm. Uh, and then I have a prayer list that goes through. You and Christy and kids are on it. And uh, um, and then I kind of pause and say, okay, God, what might you have for me today? And God, help me see things through your eyes. Give me your heart. Give me your hands. And so I begin my, my day, and, and, and stuff happens, and things go bad, and, and I have pain, and Someone invites me out for lunch. Well, that means they want to talk to me. Well, if I go out for lunch with them, I can't talk with them because I can't, I mean, I can't eat with them. Right, but right. you know what? That's okay. And so what happens is I've learned to serve my 50 times a day, God, thank you that you're present. I still fight fear. I still fight the depression. But nothing, nothing, nothing like it was. Satan has lost so much of his power because he knows when he attacks me, almost always my response will be, God, I bring this to you. This is hard. I don't have the answer. God, my son's three, and this is driving me crazy. 
and but God, I give him to you. I say to you that you can't give me more than I can handle. God, I say to you that you're present. Help me respond and not react. Because we're wired to react. Yeah, that's right. That's Help right. to respond with your voice, with your eyes, with your heart. And as, as a dad or mom, I, I know for me, as I made mistakes, I learned to go to my kids and say, hey, honey, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Daddy reacted. And uh, what you're doing is not good. You can't keep on doing it. And, you know, we have to be strong. But so how I start my day and then how I go through my day is so powerful. And and for me, uh, Josh, you might remember this. One thing I've developed, uh, every hour, if I'm aware of the hour, if, if I see zero, zero, or the big hand that, you know, is, is up at, at the top of the little hand, uh, I thank God for something. So every hour of every day at the top of the hour, I'm reminded reflexively. It's almost unconscious. Thank God that I can kind of talk. Thank God that I can kind of eat. Uh, thank God that I, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it's amazing what happens when we pause and give thanks. Not for our thanks. I can't give God thanks for bearing four family members and that I, I talk weird. But in that, I can give thanks because he can't not be present. And God, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you're here. Does that make sense, John? Uh, it makes so much sense. And, you know, I, you know, it's so good and it's so rich. And there's so many different things I want to highlight here with that. I'm trying to process how I want to do that. I think the first one for me is, you know, that sense of gratitude just for what we have. You know, I, so there's two, two, two things I want to point out gratitude, number one, and number two, how you experience your three-year-old, you know, you brought those two things up. The first one is the gratitude component, because I think so often throughout our day, what we're doing, especially when we're so busy and we're caught and we're focusing more on things that are not going our way rather than things that are. And for right. you, you are somebody, I remember you talking to me about this where by the way, I love our lunches because that's my time to be able to pour out because <laughs> you're eating and I get to pour out and talk because you can't. And so uh, it's it's great. Um, but then when we go for walks, you get to pour out. It's just lovely. I love our, our, our relationship. But, um, you know, you you mentioned this because I remember you very vividly telling me this one time where you said about gratitude, how like taking for granted taste buds, taking for granted our ability to talk, taking for granted our ability to move our mouth, taking for granted our ability to be able to smell and taste and see like our senses, every like taking for granted so many different things. So to be able to thank God at the top of every hour and to be able to create a gratitude rhythm throughout your day, I think brings us back to, to that. And the role of life stuff that you're talking about, and I, you know, I mentioned role of life, and it might be something you want to describe to those listening because it's something that I created as a result of being with you. But you know, I one of the, coming out of being with you, one of the, you know, and I say being with you. There was a moment where I went through the going deeper number a couple of years back, but um, one of my rhythms now in the morning is is reading the daily lectionary uh, that has, you know, two Psalms, two Psalm readings every morning. It's got the new Testament, old Testament and gospel reading, but reading Psalms every day has been the single most powerful part of that journey for me. And you oh. brought that up oh. where, where you get a voyeuristic look into David's journal and his diary. And you're like, Whoa, like, what am I complaining about here? And not only what am I complaining about, but look at how David, who was deter as who was known as the man after God's own heart, Look at how he took his things to God and God forgive me for not bringing my stuff to you the way that I should be, but instead fixing it, trying to, you know, allow the comforts of the world to fix it. I just and, think that, and, that Psalm reading is so huge to start our day. And one thing you've learned by now, because we've talked about it, is oftentimes in the morning when I'm done, I don't feel like I've gotten a cotton picking thing. So I don't do my morning wisdom or my holy habit or, you know, the, the various things you call it. I don't do it just to get something. 
I do it to obey and trust and be so present. Good. And it's a way of my saying, God, I'm here. I trust you. I'm just not trying to milk you for blessings. But I want to be with you and I want to become more like you. And Josh, I'm sure you found this out even in the mornings where I don't feel like, wow, oh, that was great. Uh, during the day, I am more aware of his presence. I'm less reactive. I'm more reflective. I'm more responsive. Uh, I, I find myself forgiving a bit more quicker. So as you know, you may have said it, we can't invest time with God and have it not make a difference. But we may not see it immediately. Does that make yeah. sense? It makes, a ton, it makes a ton of sense because it leads to my next point, which that rhythm for me in the morning is how I influences how I show up with my three-year-old. Yes. Yes. You know, am I looking at him through the lens of God the Father who loves him or Jesus who said, bring the children here to me as the disciples were indignant that they were paying attention to children, right? And it's like, he's like, no, bring the children here to me. And I Amen. think about his loving embrace of kids, even in this, even in their disobedience. Amen. Because I want to tell you something, I'm his kid and I'm disobedient a lot. And without his loving embrace, like, who are we? I am that three-year-old toddler. And it's not rocket science, is it? It's not complex. It's, it's not complex, but it sure is not easy. <laughs> oh, 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 no, it's not. No, no, no it's not. And, um, yeah, it, it's so much easier for us to want, want to fix or or have the answer. And, and, and God loves that, but so often we miss the process of becoming, you know, uh, we're, we're becoming conformed. We're being renewed. We're being yeah. transformed. In the Greek, those are in the aorist tense. And what that means is it starts at a point of time and it continues. So I give my life to Christ and then I'm now becoming like him. I'm, I'm being transformed. I'm being renewed. We call that the process of sanctification. But what you and I are talking about right now is something as simple as a morning rhythm, uh, as, uh, you know, uh, holy habits. Uh, that makes an enormous difference. Yeah. So, it, go ahead. Uh, well, 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 the, the second thing for me, yeah. there, there are four, uh, we may not have time to talk about them all, but uh, the second thing, and you brought this up, friend, is count your blessings. Choose to count your blessings. And I had never, ever thought, thank God for my tongue. I had never thanked God for salad, for example. I mean, I love to hawk up and in college, we could see him spit the farthest, and uh, but I, I took it. For, I, I never thanked God for any of that. But when I lost it, I remember going from MD Anderson after that surgery to where I had to stay for a month because I had to go back into MD Anderson every day because uh, over half the time that surgery uh, didn't work. Uh, we, we passed by a Chick fil A. And so I, I, I had my mouth sewn shut. I had my, my bottle here of stuff. And uh, I, I pointed, and she said, yeah, it's Chick-fil-A. And I, mm -hmm. she said, and I, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and she said, yeah. And, and I put my bottle down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I said it in love. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so she turned in, and she said, well, hon, what, what do you want? Oh, you want a Coke? Okay. My mouth is, uh, my, my jaw is blown up. My mouth is sewn shut. So get a coat. We go over the park. I take the straw and I somehow, it took a couple minutes to work it in to the corner of my mouth. And I inhaled and I got enough to have a drop or two of coat in my mouth. Josh, I started sobbing. I started sobbing uncontrollably, okay? Five earth degrees, blah, 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 blah. I can taste Coke and I'm a bastard taste because the top surgeons and one of the top cancer hospitals in the world said I would never taste them. And I found myself in tears in that car saying, God, thank you, thank you, 
say to you. And I experienced his power and presence and, and goodness. And that, to me, Fred, was a great aha. Because I, I take that for granted. So now, a part of my morning rhythm, I thank God for my legs. I thank God for my feet. Uh, I thank God that I have hair. And if I didn't have hair, that would be okay, too. So choose to count your, your, your blessings. Name them one by one. Sight and hearing. Now, walk in the taste. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, it makes so much sense. You know, one of the things that comes to my mind, too, is, you know, I think about you losing your son. And I remember when that happened. And, uh, you know, even for me, it you know, you hear the phrase, the days are long, but the years are short. And we've got, you know, a lot of listeners here who got young kids and, and a lot. Those days are really, really long. And I just think for me, this is me personally, where there are days that I they feel extra long. And, but I also realize that, you know, it's amazing how quick it's going. It's amazing how fast it's going. And just to count the blessing of thank you, God. Yes, this child is struggling right now. Yes, this child or, or, you know, whatever is happening. Thank you that you gave me this child to steward um, on this earth and to count my blessing and to therefore play with them more that 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 gratitude is what leads me into their presence it leads me into their presence yes and they know when you're present and yes. they know when you're not that's right okay number three claim god's promises choose to claim god's promises so choose to set your mind on things above choose to count your blessings and give thanks choose to claim god's promises one thing i discovered Practically, not just theologically or theoretically, God's promises are always more powerful than Satan's pessimism. And that's not a play on words. One of of, of Satan's greatest tools is to discourage us. And I can believe my mood or I can believe God. So Mm -hmm. when I focus on my problems, when I'm problem-focused, and that happens as a dad, it happens as a mom, it happens at work, it happens at home, but when I focus on my problem, it blinds us to hope. When I'm focused on what might happen, and I'm blinded to hope, I'm not aware of his presence. So what happens is we then become a prisoner of our problems. We, we become slaves to our circumstances. It's just what happens. And, uh, you know, if I take this book and, and, and hold it out here, it's one thing. But if I put it here, I have the world's largest book. If I stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon, I can say, my book is larger than the entire Grand Canyon. And as a therapist, I've spent tens of thousands of hours, literally, with people who have so focused on their problems that they have lost, totally lost their perspective. But when, with God's help, we choose, and you know, that I love that word choose a lot. It's always a choice. When I choose to be promise focused, we don't ignore our problems. We don't ignore our problems, but we focus on his promises. That leads to faith, and faith gives us hope. And somehow we begin to see things from God's perspective. So Matthew 6 33, seek the first the kingdom of God, uh, Romans 8 28 and verse 29. All things for which he gets it for good, for whom he foreknew, he predestined that we might become conformed. How do we become conformed? By trials, by doubts, by fears, by our failures. That's how we become conformed. We take it back to him. So, so in our life, our focus becomes our filter. And uh, our interpretation becomes our reality. And that, again, bro, is where what you talk about, just even that morning rhythm makes tons of difference. Where And uh, when you focus on God, I, I love this because, you know, it just takes it back. We're, we're going we're going to where it matters most. You know, we talk a lot about parenting and parenting research and, you know, X, Y, and Z. But, you know, 
at the end of the day, this is this is the core of it all. And I think everything flows out of this. Our ability to truly be present with our kids, our ability to truly be great parents flows out of everything you're talking about. And a lot of these insights came out of your Job experiences, you know, your, you know, the experiences that you've had in wrestling with God and in being with God and experiencing his presence. And I would love for you to just share with us. So when you talk about the promises of God, how can we practically I know they're in the word, right? So it's like, where can we experience more of his promises, especially when I'm so problem focused? Let's say that, you know, I'm uh, truly focused on, you know, my, that book is right in front of my eyes. You know, you hold that book up there. That book is right. It's, it, it, it's touching my nose. It's right in front of my eyes. That's my problem. Yep. And I'm so problem focused. What are some ways, what are some promises of God that you rely on, practices that you do specifically that people could say, you know what, uh, I can draw from that. One thing I've done, and, and one thing I have my my clients do, and my mentees do, uh, the men that I mentor is, um, I have them write down over like maybe a month long period, whatever, a number of promises that they have read, or when they read them, they sense God saying, "That's for you." And uh, then I'll have folks write those promises on three by five cards. The first on one side, the promise on the other. And I say, don't try to memorize them. Uh, just keep them with you and look at them once, once a day. Uh, things like my God will supply all my, all, all my needs. Uh, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, as I set my mind on things above, for example, the Psalms I read, I, I could, Almost not, I, I try to read five psalms a day usually, but um, it's almost impossible not to find a promise in one of those psalms. Um, so I tend to write down promises he's given to me or is given to me, often ones I learned through problems, often ones I learned because at first I got trapped by the problem. Uh, I, I got trapped by the what if. And uh, the bottom line is, well, what if, what if all that happens? Am I still his beloved? Yeah. Can he leave me? No. He's promised never to leave us. He's promised never to forsake us. He's promised to supply all of our needs, maybe not immediately, but he can't not over time supply our needs according to his riches and joy because he's promised. And I just find now I I have so many of those memoirs that as I claim them, and even as I speak them, the problem, okay, it's still there, but the problem I'm able to put it in perspective. Claiming God's promises does not eliminate the problem; it puts it in perspective. So good, and yeah. I can see where God might be at work in that. But as you know, bud, Satan doesn't want us to see that, huh? No, that's exactly right. And you're, you're, all of what you're talking about reminds me of Romans 5, 3 through 5, where Jesus, or where Paul writes, rejoice in suffering. And you're like, what the world? Why should we rejoice? Why should we have joy in the middle of our suffering? And he lays it out because with it comes perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope, and that hope in Christ Jesus does not disappoint. Yeah. And, um, and so, uh, take us into your fourth one because, and, and, and I want to say this too, is, as, as you talk about these, you know, the thing that I have really, I'm loosely depending on the age of my child, implementing a lot of these practices with my kids. So as you're listening and you think about this, not just, this isn't just for your own life, these, this is a way of modeling uh, how to experience the presence of God in your life for your kids. And, 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 and let me jump in. Yeah. And modeling is often more powerful, more impactful than all the good stuff you say mm -hmm. and all the stuff you quote. When they see us practicing day in, day out, that is so powerful, right? It's good. A hundred percent. I think it's everything. My kids do what my kids do what I do more than what I say to do. Yeah. It's amazing. But the adversary doesn't want us to, to know that, huh? Yeah. 
No, it's right. It's exactly right. He would rather us be able to talk about it. So what's number four? Okay, number four is choose to obey and act on what you know to be true. Um, I've learned, and I draw this down, I've learned that sovereign joy is much more than a mood. A mood invades us. A mood can attack us. I don't choose my moods. Moods happen, okay? But the victorious Christian life is a life beyond submitting to my mood. Regardless of my mood, regardless of my diagnosis, I can choose sovereign joy. I can choose to set my mind on things above. Uh, I can choose things to not for all things, but thank God that he's present. And that may not change the, the problem. The problem is there, but I'm not alone. He's in control and he is trustworthy. We can prevent our problems our frustrations with our kids, our disappointments with our spouse. We can change all of that very simply uh, by not letting it be our primary focus, not ignoring, but not our primary focus, but to put it in perspective of who we are because of whose we are. And he can't not be a promised keeper. And God, with your help, I can become a healthier husband, a healthier wife, a healthier mom, a healthier dad. With your help, I can maybe in the next month or two learn how to react less and respond more. And I can learn how to own my stuff. And I can learn how to apologize. And I can learn how to count my blessings and maybe even waste 10 minutes by thanking one by one. I never thank God for my pancreas. That's why my first wife, uh, Carrie, died. I never thank God for my son. I never thank God, you no. Know? And those are small things, but again, my friend, as we rejoice, as we give thanks, somehow that empowers his presence within us and impacts how we view, but more important, how we do life. Mm. You know, oh. It's so good. I'm I'm reading a uh, a book right now uh, that's really influencing the way that I think about everything you're talking about. It's called Imagine the God of Heaven by John Burke, and in it, one of the things he talks about is he he he, he wrote a book called Imagine Heaven uh, prior a few years back. And uh, those of you who listen to the podcast regularly may have heard me talk about this, but. You know, in these NDEs, these near death experiences, you know, one of the 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 biggest things that that Jesus or the light or however it's described uh, talks about is the good that it, it you know because one there was one experience where one person died, goes to heaven, and says, "God, why did you allow all these bad things to happen? Why are you allowing these things to take place?" and and I'm going to butcher this because I don't remember it exactly, but my takeaway from it was that it's not about what's happening. It's about the good that's coming from it. Just like Joseph, it's all about the good. It's all about advancing good, advancing love. And so, you know, but when we get focused on ourselves, when we get selfish, that's when we sin and we start to get angry and we start to, but it's, God is always about forward progress. He's always about more good, more good, more good. And I think about that in how everything that I think about, every, every, every word, action, every word and deed, thought, word and deed, thought, word and deed, how I speak, how I think, and then how I act, is it producing good in the lives of those around me? And exactly the choices, the four choices that you talked about today, the four things, I believe culminate into all of that as we show up as parents, as we show up as spouses, as we show up as sons and daughters, and as we show up in our workplaces. It is it is all of it. And I just want to thank you, Gary, for being willing uh, to go through the experiences that God took you so that I don't hopefully have to, to learn these lessons. <laughs> I'm here for you. <laughs> one thing with Gary is his sense of humor is one of the best uh, of everybody, anybody that I know on the planet. Well, but thank you for trust me. Thank you for your life and your ministry. Thank you 
that what you teach and teach is amazing. But one of the main things I love and respect about you is that what you practice, who you are as a son, who you are as a husband, who you are as a dad, that you practice as well as or even better than you preach. Anybody can preach and teach and repeat good stuff. But Josh, you really take what you say seriously. And I think it's really important from someone who knows you, who has known you, back way back when you were in the university, didn't have all your degrees and stuff, that that you have a heart, a desire for God, to honor him, to grow, and your heart's desire is to build his kingdom. And uh, so thank you for what you do. Thank you for your ministry. And uh, thanks for this opportunity to share. Oh. Thank you. Coming from you, that means so much to me. And thank you for taking the time to do this. I've, I've been wanting to share you with our audience for a long time. And um, it's an honor to have you on. So on behalf of everybody in the Famous at Home family, thank you uh, for, for giving your time and your wisdom to us today. Thank you, friend. Until next week, keep in mind that the greatest red carpet you'll ever walk is through your front door. Keep being famous at home. We love you.